It's 12 o'clock, so we, c we can start. And happy to see all of you here. And welcome to this session about Power Platform best practices. And of course, first of all, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors because without these sponsors, there won't be event like this. Free events for everyone. Superb. A little bit about myself. My name is Timo Pertila. Uh, I work as a Power Platform consultant in Forward Forever. I, I came from Finland, it, and that's the reason I, I sound like this. Uh, and I have been working with, with Canvas Power Apps and, and Cloud Pro since 2016, so from the very beginning of the history of those tools. Uh, you can find my all necessary social media accounts there, and I'm also Microsoft MVP on, on business applications area. A uh, little bit about the scope of this session. So because of my background, I'm focusing today mainly on just Canvas Power Apps and, and Power Automate. And of course, platform beneath. But if you are, for example, looking for some nice tips related to the Power BI, then, then I promise there won't be any. So <laughs> you have a little bit of time to change room if you like to do that. I have also divided this session in kind of two parts. So in first section, I go through some things that are mostly uh, interested about the, of the ID departments. ID departments are interested of those things. And then after that, I move on to this next session where I go through some, some practices best practices or tips for, for developers, less citizen developers, less makers. Okay, we can start with the IT department related stuff. And, and of course, the first thing always are the environments. So when I usually when I first meet customer, they have only one environment, default environment, and we start to discuss about the environments, and then they ask, okay, should we have something, you know, more environments than only this default environment? And of course, you should have more environments. And then they tend to ask, that, okay, what kind of environments we should have? And that's, of course, the little bit trickier one, because it all depends, as always. Uh, this is kind of an example setup of, of environments, what we are using. usually use this slide when we start to discuss about the environments. Uh, but let's simplify this a little bit. So what is kind of minimum set of environments you usually need to have? So everybody has the default environment. And it's what I think, it's kind of wild, wild west environment. It's, it's the place Everybody can try things out. They can make their own solutions, their power apps and flows. But, but if there is more users than the maker uh, as itself for that, those, those solutions, it might be not the proper place to store those, those solutions. So what we should have next? If the organization have these so-called citizen developers, it might be a good idea to create a dedicated environment for those people. So people who can actually already build something and they have already had, had built, maybe we should have an environment for those people so they can move all these, their own actual used solutions from default environment to the this system developer environment. But as you see, there is no testing environment or, or developer environment. Because those citizen developers, if they are building stuff on top of the Excel or on, on top of the SharePoint list, they usually don't have their own dev Excel or test Excel and so forth. So they are used to do things in production. But in many cases, you like to have some little bit more managed environments. And then you can think that maybe we can create some shared environments. And usually, with the shared environments, you have production environments and, and testing environments, and maybe e even developer environments also. 
Uh, and with these shared environments, the idea is that there's plenty of solutions, plenty of applications and, and flows in the same environment. And, and the scope of the environment can be the whole organization, so you might have only one shared environment set for the whole organization applications, or you might like to set uh, several shared environments, like uh, one shared environment for each of the departments or units or, or functions or whatever. So you can have plenty of these shared environment sets. And the last thing is that in many cases you have some huge solution that might have some very it might have very critical or they might have some sensitive information inside that solution and for those you like to create dedicated environments for each of the application and for example Dynamics 365 is usually having its own environment it's not run in, in shared environment with all, all, all your all other applications in the, in the organization. So this is kind of minimum set environments and you can choose those uh, uh, boxes what are most suitable for your organization. And my advice is that you, if you are starti starting your journey with the Power Platform, it, for example with these environments, start with some minimum set because you can always create more environments and when, when you know what you are actually needing then you can move on but don't overdo your your environment set in the first place and related to the environments i have few few tips also i like to share if we are going here in power platform admin center and go to power platform settings by default, everybody can create new environments. And, and my advice is that you, might, you should uh, restrict uh, the permission to create new environments for only specific admins. And also, by default, this tenant level <coughs> analytics is turned on. And, and I advise you to turn it on because it's, it's a nice way to get automatic analytic reports uh, covering all your environments. So by default, all the analytics is uh, are scoping only one environment, and it's very hard to see what is going on in tenant level. But if you turn this on, you get nice uh, analytics on on apps and and flows covering all all your tenant. And then when you cr when you create new environment. having database along, it wise, usually it's uh, wise to, in this point, add security group in this environment, because if you don't add any security group in to the environment when you create that one, then you, can, you don't have any control which of the tenant users are actually provisioned as a environment users during the creation or after. So in, in large organizations, you might have plenty of users on your new environment just because you didn't uh, attach those, those security group on that environment during the creation. So please, in most of the cases, please add some security group to control which of the tenant users are actually provisioned as uh, environment users in your new signy environment. And same with the slides. Next thing, the IT department usually is very keen of <laughs> are the costs. And from my point of view, that or what, what how I see that is that there is actually three cost component in, in, in Power Platform. First, we have licenses. And luckily most of the IT people they are aware that in some cases there might be some licensing cost when you are building stuff on top of the power platform. They maybe they don't know all the details but they are aware about this licensing stuff. Uh, but there's more. 
And if the organization doesn't have any Dynamics 365 implementations, they usually are not aware about the database capacity thing, that there is such a thing than database capacity, and also there is a thing called Power Platform requests. So a few words about the tool, tool later on. So there is no such a thing than that kind of unlimited database capacity on your tenant. So when you create new environment, it consumes database capacity. And when you start to uh, store information on your database, database, it consumes that capacity. And same thing uh, with the power button requests. There is no such a thing that like unlimited number of power button requests. There is some limits that are related to the users and, and the licenses users having. So, if you run out of these two, you have to buy somehow more. So, be aware. And because of that, you should, of course, monitor what is the situation with those two guys. And you can do, with the capacity point of view, you can do this handily uh, from the admin center. So, there is a pretty nice overview what is the situation uh, about the capacity on your tenant. So please watch this one from time to time. But unluckily, <laughs> about these power platform requests, they know there's no today, there's no one report you can open and, and see where we are going with our tenant uh, power platform requests now. But Microsoft has promised that there will be such a report, and when they publish that report, that's the different one the ID people should be monitored regularly. And then, if you find out some applications that are using huge amount of, of the capacity, those, of course, should be audited. And same thing with the request, probably the request. If you find out, it's typically th they are flows that are consuming huge amount of of the request, those flows should also be audited. Uh, because it might be that, for example, that Cloudflow is built by some citizen developer not so experienced, and there might be plenty of things you can optimize with those flows. So you don't necessarily have to buy more requests. You can, you can fix those flows to, uh, to, to do less those requests. And the last thing, the IT department is very interested in, is the security. They have all kinds of questions related to that one. And, and the first thing and the basic thing on the security area are the data loss prevention policies. Uh, because in data uh, in Power Platform, when you are building applications or flows, you are usually reading some data from somewhere, doing something with that data, and storing the data to some same places or, or, or other places. And all these reading and writing stuff is done uh, with connectors. So the connectors is the key thing, accessing any data or any services with these tools. And the data loss prevention policies is mechanism how you can control what connectors makers can use on, on, on the solutions they are building. So it's kind of key element of making restrictions what, what people can actually, in, in high level, what they can do. Uh, and the beginning of the data loss prevention policy, when they published this first time, the only thing what you could do <coughs> was this kind of dividing all the connectors in two baskets. There was business, co business connectors basket and non-business connector basket. And, and the concept is that, that when a maker built, for example, flow, the maker couldn't mix connectors between those baskets. So if you have divide 
you connect to show that all the uh, Microsoft 365 and Azure connectors are in business connectors basket and all the rest are in non-business connector basket. Then when the maker make flow and read data, for example, from the SharePoint list, then after that he couldn't or she couldn't add a connector to save that same data, for example, uh, to the Google Drive, because the Google connector and the SharePoint connector are in different baskets. Okay, but th this basketing, I think this was, okay, it's simple, but for the most of the customers, it's, it's kind of confusing how I should divide these, these connectors. And luckily, this is not today the only, only way to do this. So today, we can also just block the connectors. So we can say that, okay, in this environment, uh, you can't use Twitter connector at all. It's, it's forbidden. End of the story. And you can do more. You can also block endpoints. So some of the connectors have, have endpoints, like, like HTTP connector or SQL connector. So with, with that one, you can define that, for example, in this testing environment, you can only access SQL databases on our uh, uh, SQL testing subscription subscription, and or, or test, uh, test, test SQL databases. And in production, you can access only the production SQL databases. And even better, today we can block not whole connector, but for block some actions inside the connector. So we can say with in our DLP policies that, okay, in this environment, you can use the Azure SQL connector, but you can't use the delete action inside the Azure SQL connector. So you, ca you can read, write, whatever, but you can't delete items uh, with these tools. And you can scope, you can build one policy, and you can scope the policy to the all environments, all, uh, all environments, but not these ones, or just some selected environments. And you can have plenty of these DLP policies. And, and then the, uh, the when, when Maker adds something in, in some flow, in some environment, then the platform calculates, OK, is this, is this allowed or, or not? And again, my advice is that start with some simple DLP policies, because I have seen some customers, they have you know, a huge amount of separate DLP policies, and nobody knows how they're actually working today. So be just start with some simple one, and then when you learn more, then you can add more, more logic and more sophisticated policies in your environment. But I can also show, show you shortly how this actually looks like. So here in admission to these policies, and here I have my simple policy that is blocking Google service. So here we can see these two baskets. Now in this policy, everything is, all the 700 plus connectors are in non-business basket, but I have blocked all the Google service. So these are not allowed. And where, in which environments they are not allowed, actually it's in here that it's scoped in some uh, selected environments. And here I say that this scope is, uh, this DLB policy is valid in my default environment. And how this looks in, in from the maker point of view, here I have my nice flow in default environment that is listing all the calendar events from my Google Calendar. And thi uh, this, has to, this has been created before I create that DLB policy. But now I can see there is a red mark here, and if I try to save this one, it says that it I can't save, I can't do any changes on that flow because it's violating the DLB policy called block, block Google servers, and it actually Said that which of the actions is the reason uh, for that. And if, if we go here in the settings of the flow, 
we can see that it's suspended. It means that it, it, it was working, it was in on on some point of time, but after I created a TLP policy, the platform shut it down and marked the status as suspended. The suspended tells us that uh, this is violating the policy. And if I try to turn this on, I can't do that because it's violating the policy. Yes, it's kind of powerful way to, to control what, in high level, what kind of stuff people can build with the pl platform. Then, a few words uh, about flow. So, when you are building production level flows, please make sure that there is no anybody's personal credentials, credentials or connect connections used on those flows. Please use always kind of service accounts, connections or, or service principal if you are dealing with the database. Because, of course, if you are using somebody own connections, the people are leaving the company and when, when the people are left the company and, and she or his connection is used and the flow at the end stopped working because there is no such account anymore in the organization. So don't use any any personal accounts on, on the connections in the flows that are run in, in production environments. That's of course not to do that. But then <coughs> for the IT point of view, that be be careful if you have secrets on your flows like like passwords, API keys or something you read from the key vault. Because IT people, they, they, they saw the whole thing and, oh, there's this, this nice looking key vault actions that you can put all the stuff on the key vault and just read them and, and we are safe. And let's see how this <coughs> is actually working. So here I have my flow and it's reading something from the key vault and then it's just doing something with that that secret and I'm using that setting here that we can uh, have secure inputs and secure outputs so it means that that is super super confidential stuff are not shown in the flow history so now I'm running this one and okay we can't read those secrets from the history but people usually forget that if I can read the history, then I always also can edit this thing. So what I can do, if I like, I can just go there and turn these secure inputs and outputs off and just wait <coughs> that this flow is running again. And after that, I can read all the secrets from here. So just be aware that when you store something in the key vault and you use all these security stuff inside the flow, keep in mind that still you have to be very careful who can access this flow and who can edit those flow because at the end everybody who can access they can they can read those secrets and, and use those also. Yeah, please aware that who, who can access, who can access, because, and, and especially with when you have those shared environments, be, care, be, be careful what kind of permissions you get, uh, give the people for those environments. Because if you can edit things, you can see a lot. And the last thing is that, and this is also for the maker point of view, that be, be super careful when you share the flow to somebody else. And here I have also an uh, example about that one. It's here. Here I have simple flow I have created. That I just get items uh, from the SharePoint, some SharePoint list, nothing else. 
And now I decide to share this flow uh, with my colleague. It's called Big Boss. And now it's saying something, and as we know, nobody reads those. <laughs> but you definitely should, beca because it, it actually it's everything is told in that th in that <laughs> message. <laughs> but as you know, uh, I haven't read it. You you don't. I know nobody nobody reads those stuff. But but what what actually happens? It's when you share the flow, you actually share the connection, and and it's dangerous. Now I'm I'm here with my my colleague account and here I see that yeah this is the flow I just share and now I edit this one yeah here's my my SharePoint action and let's see ooh this is run with my credentials, not by, by my colleague. So what, what the colleague can now do, of, of course he can now read items from this shared point list, and actually he can, of course, he can chase the site, he can read items from every shared point list I can access and he don't. And even better, he can add new actions, new shared point actions here, like what would be nice, <laughs> delete and just pick OK. Yeah. <laughs> and now he can delete stuff from all the SharePoint list I have access, but, but he or she doesn't. Or make modifications and modify by which, be, which will be Timo Pertila, not, not the big boss. Yeah. So please, if you like to share something, you. <laughs> Please be make, make sure that you know there's no connections using your personal credentials. And of course, if you like to just just share something nice you you have done with the colleague, you can always use the send a copy. And what this do, do it's kind of the people who who has receiving the send a copy, he just get link and he actually creates new flow and creates new connections with with that people credentials. But yeah, but people like to do the sharing and <laughs> and it's it's kind of super super dangerous at the end. So please be careful about that one. <coughs> and from the ID point of view it's kind of boring, but if you are if you have this power platform and you are responsible of that, it means that there's you have to do something. There is some kind of tasks. So my advice is that you should have some kind of regular cleaning days. It, it, I don't know, it might be once a week, once a month, once a quarter, whatever. It depends how much there is stuff on your power platform. But you, you definitely have to do something regularly. For example, uh, you can spend time with cleaning your default environment. It, uh, w to be honest, many of my customers, they don't do that because it always, already so much stuff in default, there's no way you can somehow keep it nice and clean. And, and that's the reason you should do more environments because you have your proper environments and you focus on that your proper environments are clean and nice and, and so forth. But for example, what you can do, you can delete Recognize and delete not used apps and flows, or, or some flows that are owned by people who are not working the organization anymore, and nobody's using those. You can spend some time to, you know, get rid of those. But what you should do is that you should go through your default environment and recognize if there is some new stuff somebody has created that is actually used by bunch of the people, because those applications usually they don't belong in default environment. You should start the process to move those on the proper environment. And of course, as I said, you should check your capacity, check the status of the power button requests. From time to time you should actually validate your environment strategy because it's not written in stone. You, you, you 
you have something and then you 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 have more makers and you have more external consultants build stuff and it, it will be, be the time that you have to reshape your environment strategy and same thing with the DLP policies and if you have some gateways you are your makers are building stuff that is accessing on-premise stuff uh, data then those gateways has to be also be care of that they are updated okay that's the first part now we can move on uh, to the makers less developers less system developer uh, uh, part and the first thing usually is that when some people start to build stuff the, the question is that okay what data source I should use with this my my application and from Microsoft area there's these kind of options and from many citizen developers the excellence airport are the most familiar ones and from the pure developer point of view the SQL and database are of course the most uh, familiar ones and what I think I think that you actually have only three options to choose for uh, and if you don't know the difference between these then it might be a good idea that when you start to planning something you are building something then just have a short meeting with somebody who knows and then go through what, what kind of requirements you have today what kind of roadmap what 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 kind of roadmap you have what what the solution would look like after f like three years and then have sort of discussion and decide what is the best options for this solution <laughs> and what I think I think that if, if the license are not the issue then go with the full database every time but unfortunately the licenses might be the issue so and in this ca that case if you don't have money to go to full database then go with the database for teams if you don't have any <coughs> special reason to go with the SharePoint and, and, and there is few that actually move you easily from database for the teams to the SharePoint for example if, to li if you like if you don't want this it's no way that people are using for example your canvas apps through the teams because with database for teams everything is used inside the teams and for example in the mobile case it might be the source stopper that, that you force people open teams app on your phone and then navigate to the app inside the teams that might be the case <coughs> okay and then move on to the power apps and then one thing is this naming convention yeah everybody hates to rename those 300 labels there uh, and it's usually when you build power apps it's kind of you know everything it's 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 no kind of reason or motivation to why I should rename those uh, controls but trust me it time ago and and you have to do some changes on your power apps after like a one year and even worse somebody else has to do some changes on your power apps after year or two and and that point it is much more easier to get the overview what is happening in this app if you have spent a little bit time to rename all the controls properly like like here in the in the right side and here you can see this link on one master documents where the Spore apps guidelines are staying and there is one one naming convention presented there and and really I, I don't care what naming conventions you are using just use something just it, it doesn't matter just use some naming conventions and, and and then I have one tip for the super lazy people as I know that we, we are here I have my 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 canvas app and please do me a favor if, if you just for some reason you just don't rename your controls please rename the controls that controls that you are using on your formulas like here in the label tree because 
these are super <laughs> annoying to read. Of course, you can, you can highlight the, this one and it, it shows what the control is. But, but still, if you have plenty of formulas and you are referring controls in your formulas, please rename at least those controls that you are using on your formulas because otherwise it's, it's super annoying and it's, it's, it's hard to read what, what's happening here. What, what is this label here and why it should be more than 10,000? So please do at least that. The next one with the canvas apps, please use these version notes. Every time you save, you can, you can write some version note. And, and what I do, oh, let's see. And these version notes, yes, these are shown in, in, in version history on your, on your canvas apps. And when you build canvas apps, it's, it's much, you might easily get 100 versions or 200 versions. And, <coughs> and again, I promise it, the time will come that you have to restore some old version for some reason. And it might be tricky if you have just you know, 200 versions during this one month. And what I do, I don't you know, type version notes for each of the uh, versions, but how, how I approach this is that I, I try to build something like, like this form or navigation or this home screen. I, I when, whenever I build some part ready, then I save and mark, that, okay, this version contains the, the new navigation component or this version co contains this, this form that is now the first version of that form. Or now I have changed all the, all the fonts or something like that. Kind of key versions, I have these version notes and then I have it's much more easier if I have to restore some, some version. I can see that which, which of the versions are kind of the, the, the major ones. So please use version notes. It's, it helps your life. And then republish your apps regularly. As you see here, my, my apps, it, it, the live version is from what? I know, late 10 to 1, uh, and it's running super old code, this, this, uh, this app you are seeing now. It's, it's one and a half year old code that's running. So if you have Power Apps is running in production, people are using those, but you are, you are not making any change for those applications, you still should, from time to time, open that app do some cosmetic change and republish because the republish is the only way that you can get all the improvements from the platform, all the uh, uh, security improvements, performance improvements and so forth. The only way to get those in your running app is to republish the app. And then one note there that it's also that you can't restore any app that is older than six months. So that it also motivates you that every, for example, every second month, do, uh, do the republishing process on, on your app. And the last thing related to the Canvas apps is, is you really should avoid copy pasting the code. And this is, I don't, maybe not the for the pro developers, but the citizen developers tend to do this a lot. And almost all Canvas apps, you have some functions, so some formula you are using in many, same piece of code you are using in many different places. And it's so easy to just get the formula piece working and then copy paste it every, every place you are using that. But of course it, ends up a little bit nightmare if you have to maintain that app. You open the app after six months or one year and you have to do some changes of that formula and you just can't remember where all the places where you have copy pasted that, that formula. So what you can do, instead of copy pasting the code, you can always do today component and you run the component and the component have the formula inside, but it, it, this is not kind of citizen developer stuff, I think. 
I, it's, it's maybe too, too much. But the old school trick is that you can have button having all that formula and you can hide the button and then in the other places you can just select that button and ru run that code. That one, it's, it's, it's so it's in some situation, but it's, it's, it's not uh, the way to go in, in all situations. But, but the I think the key thing, the, 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 the first thing is, is just keep in mind that you can always refer from other controls to the one control you can refer to other <coughs> controls. And with when you keep this in your mind, you can actually avoid this copy pasting shit a lot. And I can show example of this one. Yes, I have here my 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 app. And the logic is here that if I uncheck this and check this and, and the current username is Timo Pertela, then all these four boxes are shown. And I have here in my visible uh, part I have this code that yeah this has to be checked and this has to be not checked and username is this and then this is visible. And then uh, I have the same code of course copy pasted on the visible property of all these four boxes. And this is something I I see a lot. And of course the problem is now if I like to change somehow this logic, how these four boxes are shown, then I have to change the same thing in, in, in four places. But what I can do, because I have my formula here in my first box, so this visible is already calculated, with this second box I don't need to do this anymore because I can just refer that this visibility, this visibility uh, now I have to rect, 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 this one. My visibility will be same than the first box visibility that having this code. And now I can copy paste this one to every place. And if I like to do changes, <coughs> now all the boxes are working same way and now I have to do when I need to do changes I, I do changes here and all these boxes are working automatically same way because I just refer the output of the first first box so this is pretty easy way to get rid of many copy pasting situations just keep in mind that you can always refer uh, to the other controls on your app. But please don't do that between the screens because if you are doing that between the screens then you are creating dependencies between the screens and, and it has performance impact. But still, okay, it might, it, it all depends. You c these dependencies, if you have simple application, it might be that it's not so big harm. It's, it's, it's loading a little bit slower, but as, as I always say that, you know, just do something that works for you. I'm, I'm not touching anything. Just the, the, the key thing for, especially for the citizen developers, the key thing is that you can get something that works for you. And I think after that you can start to learning how you can do it better. But the key thing is that you actually can build something that is working. Okay, then move on. Yeah, we have still six minutes time few words about the flows and the same thing here same thing with the flows the first thing is the naming please rename your flow actions similar way than you should rename your canvas app controls and how uh, I do this I, I always keep the original name of the action and then after that I add my own label. And why I do that? The reason is that, like here, we I immediately see that this is Dataverse action, but now I immediately see also that, okay, this is listing stuff. So it's kind of easier for me 
to understand what is happening here because these these action names are familiar for me. And then I tell a little bit more here that what is actually doing. And and the second reason I keep the original name is that some actions have different versions. And now I see immediately, okay, this is the V2 of this send an email action. What I also do, if I have some some weird like filter action here, then I describe. Descri describe what I what this filtering is doing here in, in notes. You can edit notes here. So you don't put all the stuff on, on the action name. You can always use also these notes. And new thing is that you can actually have comments also for the actions. And this commenting is pretty handy. You can you can it's, it's a way you can document your flow and it also ways you can have discussions for if, if there's several people building this flow you can have discussions related some actions or you can have some tasks for yourself that okay this is something you you should revisit uh, or 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 do a little bit nicer way afterwards but th these are the three things you can do uh, with the flows naming actions and use notes and and comments and the last topic of this session is error management. Again, something that citizen developers usually forget. Even consultants sometimes forget this. So the question is that when you are building flow or pro apps, is your flow, flow or apps aware of errors? Because we are dealing with the data sources. And it always can happen that there is some, you know, some connection issue or you try to save uh, uh, string to the integer field or something, whatever. So there can be errors uh, when people are running flow or, or apps. Uh, and the question is that are you as a developer, as a maker, is your app and flow aware of those errors? And if you somehow catch those errors, then what do you actually do with those? Okay, with the apps, it, if you have some process going on, it, of course you should in that process and tell the users, okay, there's error, and now you, you have to do something. Uh, and then you might, for example, like to lock those errors in somewhere like Application Insight or some SharePoint list or send email to some, some master user or whatever. Uh, but in Flow, I think this is super important in, in Flow because if Flow fails, then the Flow owner gets email at some point of time. That you have these flows that has been uh, failing, and usually at that time it's 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 too late already. So it's it's super important that you you have some error management on your flows, and and let's look that part, the flow part, as our last uh, example. So here I have the same flow. Same flow about the accounts, like here, the same thing, but now I have using this such basic pattern of, of error management in, in, in the flow. So I have one scope, scope actions, and all the stuff I like to do is inside that scope. And the beauty of the scope is that if anything fails inside the scope, then the whole scope is failing. And then I have, after my main, my, my main flow, I have second scope, and I have uh, <coughs> configured it so that this flow is running only when this, this first one is failing or has timed out. So if this some, something inside here fails, then this one is run. And what I do, I, I, I parse the flow, function so I get some information about the name of the flow and so forth and then I just post a message in this case uh, in the IT team and there is some channel for, for all the errors and then I post message that the cloud flow named this one has been failed and then I generate URL that actually points to that uh, failed flow run. So easy way 
that people are showing in real time that, okay, there is failed resolution, you can open the failed flow straight from the message. And then I terminate the flow so that actually in the flow run history, this, this flow is actually also failed. So this is the kind of basic concept for managing errors and handling errors in the, flo in the flow side. And of course, here on, on Aeroscope, you can do whatever you want. I like to post these messages to the teams, but of course you can open ticket on your ticketing system or you can put stuff on the application inside. You can collect the errors on the SharePoint list or just send email to some. You can do whatever you can do with the flow. But please do something if your flows are failing. Yes? Where is your logic for if there is an error or is it just the fact that there are two scopes stacked Yeah, yeah. The, the lo the, the, this is the beauty because if, if now, if some su any actions here inside the scope is failing, then this, this scope action it fails also. So, uh, and the beauty is that I don't need to build, uh, build uh, kind of error management for the all the actions because I can just that handle the whole thing as a whole. That okay, if if something fails, then I do something. Yeah. And luckily, we have spent <laughs> 51 minutes, and uh, this is the end of this story. I'm so happy you was here, and I'm I will be here whole day and tomorrow. So if you have something on your mind you like to ask, you can always knock me to the, my bald head and, and shoot something. Thank you all. <laughs>